Thank you so much for having me. I'm really pleased to be here. I sound very echoey, so that's interesting. So everyone, I just want to reiterate some of the amazing things that, that we've heard read to us today. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way until they reached an inhabited town. Those words really resonate with me as an Underground Railroad descendant. Now, I must state for the record, out of respect for my amazing father, who is now 90 years old and a very faithful member of All Saints as well, that my mother's side of the family are Underground Railroad descendants, as well as descendants of free people of African uh, heritage who came to Canada in the mid 19th century. My father is an immigrant as of the 1960s from the amazing country of Trinidad and Tobago. So I certainly want to lift up those ancestors as well. Though I will not be speaking much about my Afro-Caribbean ancestors today, I certainly recognize, appreciate and give thanks to God for their resistance against the terrible institution of slavery for their resilience and determination and courage as well. But today I'm talking more about the Canadian side of the family. And there are other things that I want to share with you just to, to touch on a few things that we also heard in the readings today. Take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. We know, we know that there were so many members of the enslaved people holding class, many members of the enslaving class, those who benefited from slavery, who drew upon selected passages from the scripture to justify what they were doing. And they were very selective, weren't they, in choosing those passages and actually using them as a means to express the view that slavery was fine and that it was ordained by God and that there was nothing wrong with it. But many people knew better. And despite, despite the efforts of those individuals who were committed to maintaining the cruel system of slavery, we know that our ancestors and their allies and accomplices who believed in the true good news of the Bible prevailed. No matter how much the Bible was used to keep people in place, to keep them in bondage, and to, to keep them basically in a state of untruth. Our ancestors, so many of them, drew strength and hope from the good news and often aligned themselves, saw themselves in alignment and in solidarity with the Hebrew people of the Old Testament. You see that come out in so many of the hymns and the spirituals of the era that people of African descent throughout North America, at least, saw themselves as being the inheritors, the descendants of the Hebrew people who also sought freedom from their bondage. And often biblical passages, biblical terminology were used as tools of liberation rather than as tools of oppression to help our ancestors to find their way north through the Underground Railroad. Thanks be to God. I also want to just remind all of us that we've been told if we have been raised with Christ, we must seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God and set our minds on the things that are above, not on things that are on earth. And that we are to sort of walk away from the ways we once followed when we were living that life. We have to get rid of those things. There is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. My goodness, the readings for today are so perfect for Emancipation Weekend. Certainly we're aware that for many of us uh, who have ancestors who arrived uh, through the Underground Railroad, Canada was a place of liberation. It was a place of legal freedom. It was often known as Canaan to people in the South who were living in slavery. But we also recognize that slavery existed here. So this day that we celebrate, August 1st, 1834, the day that slavery was abolished across the British Empire, we cannot lose sight of the fact that enslaved people 
of African and Indigenous descent here in our wonderful country of Canada were liberated on that day. Certainly those of us who are familiar with history here in Ontario are aware of the act to limit slavery and we give thanks to people of good conscience like Sir John Graves Simcoe and his allies who were dedicated to trying to find a way to end slavery, but who had to settle for a compromise in the 1790s. That act to limit slavery that was passed in the Upper Canada Legislature did not end slavery here. It only limited it. It prevented enslaved people from being brought legally into the province. It meant that those who were under the age of 25 had to be freed when they attained that age. But for many others, they continued to live in bondage. And we know that there were people who were still living in slavery here, even as self-emancipating Underground Railroad travelers were finding their way north to Canaan through the Underground Railroad. But August 1st, 1834 was a date of great importance, not only for those who were living in slavery here in Canada still at that time, although there were not many by that time, and certainly to the over 30,000 people of African descent, both formerly enslaved people and free people of African heritage who made their way here to the promised land as they saw it. I hope that we never lose sight of the fact that when they arrived here, so many of them found that it was a hostile environment. It was not the welcoming environment that many had perceived it to be, or that we tend to describe in our contemporary narratives about Canada's role in the Underground Railroad. No, our ancestors had to fight for every right other than their legal freedom once they arrived here. And so often for them, churches were a site of liberation. I know that for my particular ancestors and for the ancestors of many others, Building a church in these towns and communities where Black settlers had arrived was often the first order of business after attaining accommodations and employment and the necessities, the basic necessities of life. There are so many stories of freedom seekers almost immediately working together to build the structures that would allow church to take place in the way they had always wanted to gather together. And here in Windsor, where I am from, we have still with us a beautiful place, Sandwich First Baptist Church, which was built in part by some of my ancestors and the ancestors of many other people. It was built in 1851. It was dedicated on Emancipation Day, 1851. And today, the Black community of Windsor, Essex will hold our emancipation festivities there all day long. I'm actually missing some of them, but I'll get there shortly. We know that for many people, churches were a site of liberation, not only in a spiritual sense, but in the sense of trying to work together, finding community, and addressing the racism and the difficulties that they were facing. Churches were places where conventions and meetings took place to figure out how to get people enfranchised so that they would have a voice in the political system. Churches were a place where fundraising took place to enable refugees newly arrived to be treated with dignity, clothed and housed until they could get on their feet. Churches were places where funds were raised for anti-slavery activities still ongoing in the United States where slavery would not end for another 30 years. Churches were places where people sought education and had finally, at long last, the opportunity to gain literacy and numeracy. They didn't have to be taught how to think. They already knew that but many of the enslaved individuals had been denied education and this was their chance. So schools were often set up in conjunction with the black churches. We have to be conscious of the fact that there were people of European descent and indigenous descent, other folks who were committed to helping, supporting, lifting up and welcoming people of African descent who came into these territories. And we have to be conscious of the fact that sometimes they weren't so welcoming. So that is sort of 
something that we, we tend not to focus on very much when we're telling the history of the Underground Railroad era in Canada, the difficulties that people faced to get the vote, to be able to exercise the vote without fear of violence or harassment, the difficulties people faced in terms of deep segregation and indeed lack of access to publicly funded schools. But our ancestors almost directly out of slavery worked so hard collectively and with faith and with hope and with courage to overturn those unjust systems. So here we are today, I come to you as a daughter of multiple Underground Railroad families, including but not limited to the Robbins family who were enslaved in North Carolina and Tennessee and made their way to North Buxton to the Elgin settlement, including but not limited to the Dunn family who were enslaved in Frankfort, Kentucky, made their way to St. Thomas, then to London and then to Windsor including but not limited to my Christian family ancestors who were enslaved in Mason County, Kentucky, made their way to Sandwich and then to Windsor. For all of these people, for their horrific journeys, but for their constant uh, faith, their determination, their hope, their resourcefulness, their creativity, their critical thinking, their courage, their absolute refusal to be sent back into slavery. I give thanks to God every day. And I am thankful for all of the ancestors who made it here and for the ancestors who chose to remain and build lives in Canada even after slavery had ended in the United States. What does Emancipation Day mean to me? It means an opportunity to celebrate and give thanks for those journeys and for the ongoing resistance and resilience of many generations of African Canadians who have preceded me, those who are my blood relations and others. But it also means to me an opportunity to look at the ways in which emancipation is a process, an ongoing process, and something towards which we all must continue to strive. I hope that emancipation means something similar to you, that it is an opportunity not only to reflect on the past, our illustrious past, and the welcome, the legal welcome at least, that we offered to people who were freeing, uh, escaping uh, from slavery or self-emancipating, but that it is an opportunity to look at the present and to look forward at all of the things that we as people of faith can do, should do, must do to ensure that true full emancipation happens in our time. What do I mean by that? In closing, I will say that there are still many forms of oppression that we must overcome pertaining to people of African, Black, and Caribbean descent in our country and in our communities. We know that Black students are more likely to be expelled from high school than white students. We know that Black workers are more likely to experience racial discrimination in the workplace. We know that Black university graduates, despite having equal educational attainment to others, earn only 80 cents for every dollar earned by their white counterparts here in our country. We know that black women are three times less likely to have a family doctor than non-racialized women here in Ontario. We know that in multiple jurisdictions and cities and towns, black residents are 20 times or similar amounts of, of times more likely than white residents to encounter violence in law enforcement encounters. We know that black students are routinely streamed into uh, academic or non-academic levels that are not suitable for them or for their aspirations, and that that is something we must continue to work against. We know that many people of our cultures are overrepresented in the criminal justice system and the child protective service systems. We know that there is massive inequity in terms of earnings and income despite educational attainment. We know that there are massive inequities in terms of access to capital and financial resources. We know that there are massive inequities in terms of employment, underemployment, unemployment, lack of promotion and opportunities. We know that we have many, many people who are stopped by police at an unfair level. There are so many things that we have to consider in our present time, not just reflecting on the past and on how far we've come, but understanding that there is still work to do. So in closing, I would encourage you to ask yourself, 
what you as people of faith, as a person of faith can do in our time to ensure that there is full emancipation for all of our brothers, sisters, and siblings, all of us. We all have responsibilities to carry out. And we know that in our baptismal covenant, we have all agreed to proclaim by word and example, the good news of God in Christ, to seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving our neighbors as ourselves, to strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being. May it be so every day of the year. Happy emancipation.